Hello, my name is Aris Julian. I'll be talking about the history of physical activity in the past. The history of physical activity as a discipline was considered to be on an upswing around the 1980s because of the many measures of academic vitality. This trajectory has continued throughout the years. One of the scholarly organizations that were important and contributed to the subfield was the North American Society for Sports History. NASSH draws historians also from kinesiology and human movement departments, but also from history, sports studies, American studies, journalism, and other programs. The proliferation of subdisciplinary societies has been matched by an increasing openness in the last 40 years to present historical contributions at major conferences in the parent discipline of history. The two largest history or associations in the U.S., American Historical Associations, and Organization of American Historians routinely featured sessions on the history of physical activity. The American Historical Association has a special session devoted to the history of sport in partnership with the NASSH. American Studies Association has a vibrant sports caucus. In addition, scholarly societies and a variety of other subfields from women's history to African American history to history of uh, the American West to diplomatic history include sessions connected to physical activity and human movement. So too do American studies, popular culture, culture studies, gender and sexuality studies, and other cultural and critical studies social societies that increasingly populate the humanities and social sciences. Boutique societies devoted to the particular forms of physical activity from every variety of football to baseball to cricket to the Olympic Games sponsor uh, academic gatherings. So the history of physical activity also litters the landscape of landscape at interdisciplinary kinesiology gatherings. From mega, me from mega meetings of old American Association of Health, Physical Education, Recreation, and Dance to the National Academy of Kinesiology meetings. In addition, number the number of outlets for history of physical activity scholarships have expanded over the past centuries. The number of journals devoted to the history of physical activity has increased since Roberta Park surveyed the landscape. Journals such as Sports and History, the Journal of Sport History, and the International Journal of the History of Sport rank in the top quartile of cognate discipline publications. The achievements and longevity of these journals that have been regularly published for over 35 years attest to status and success of the field. The history of physical activity uh, presents a more complex portrait of research products as a monograph, which is a book length study. It represents the commonly accepted pinnacle of scholarly achievement of physical activity. The number of monographs in the history of the human movement have exploded since 1981 when scholars struggled to convince publishers that their subject had a market. Another one of the strengths of the subdiscipline is that, given the popularity of sport and in, con in contemporary global culture, major commercial presses publish his histories of physical activity in an effort to attract general and academic readers. Overall, journal articles, monographs, and publication prospects for historians of physical activity are better since 1981 with both quality and, qu and quantity of work. Scholars who are significant contributors to our field are polymaths, who contributed to multiple disciplines, but each has an impact on history. History is the NAK's specialized areas and within the American Kinesiology Association's core components of an undergraduate education. Historical and philosophical aspects of kinesiology are an essential component of kinesiology education. So one critical area that we are lacking in now since 1981 is the number of doctoral programs in kinesiology that train future historians of physical activity, which has decreased drastically. So if you look at the slide, it shows you the different universities that had these programs. Unfortunately, a lot of these programs have been wiped out. So I mean, generally, this lack of history of physical activity component and many of, of the 43 doctoral programs in the U.S. that train future scholars does not look well for the future of our subdiscipline.
now I would like to shift our attention towards the present day and how these subdisciplinaries are being handled within the field of kinesiology. So as mentioned in the Anderson and Van Emmerich article and the Dryerson and Schultz article, we see a lot of similarities between these um, subdisciplinaries in which are handling more pressing issues uh, within a societal concern. And this has to relate to the subdisciplinaries of history, philosophy, and sociology. And these are really big issues within the field because there are no direct answer to them. And a lot of people have their own opinions, which plays a role into these categories. So within the subdisciplinaries of kinesiology, um, historians are now discovering that we are shifting our attention uh, from just sports and we are addressing more critical cultural issues and trying to redirect the broad audience's attention towards these issues. So one of the issues that we have today in which um, the field of kinesiology and its subdisciplinaries are tackling are the ideas of sex. So within sports today, there is a two sex system in place in which categorizes where an individual should be allowed to play in. And this affects um, athletes who are gender non confirming and athletes who are transgender due to the fact that they don't have a specific category or league in which they could play in. And this is an issue because these leagues basically qualify them to be allowed to participate in a certain league. So within the subdisciplinaries, um, this plays a big role within the physiology and sociology as we are looking at the body of each individual and the injustice and equality that each individual faces due to these consequences. So how are kinesiologists today looking at these matters? We are looking at the sex organisms, chromosomes, genetics, and newly the exogenous testosterone levels of individuals and to really see where they should actually be able to participate in and not just by appearance. So from this, we get to see how kinesiology could change possibly where an athlete is able to participate within sports. The next issue that I would like to talk about is race. So race norming has been a big topic and issue uh, that's been going on within the field for about a long period of time. Um, in 2020, there was a lawsuit against the NFL because they did not compensate former players who suffered uh, degenerative effects of traumatic brain injury. And this was due to the fact that um, within their formula to see whether or not an athlete is within the cognitive baseline, they factored in race within that formula, which made it so that black athletes had a lower cognitive baseline than a white athlete. And this played a role into whether they're determined of having neurological impairment from playing. And overall from this, this showed racism within the sport. So now um, today, athletes are getting basically compensated for what they should have gotten back then for not being identified as having these neurological impairments. So overall, these also show the subdisciplinaries of motor development and sociology as we look at um, an athlete's uh, brain function throughout playing the sport and the injustice and equality that athletes face throughout playing. As we close out our Dreisen and Schultz article, we look to how historians and an understanding of our past is essential in addressing health issues of today and facets of fitness that should be focused upon moving forward. It was Winston Churchill that once said, those who fail to learn from history are condemned to repeat it, which is an applicable quote but as you will see, 
we are facing health issues that are far worse today than they were yesterday. As health technology rapidly increases and our understandings of how our bodies function are ever more vast, one would think that societally we would be at an all-time high for fitness. But this is not the case and most apparent in our youth populations. Reviewing the Center for Disease Control's data on childhood obesity over the past 50 years, we see in 1971, U.S. children ages 2 through 19 had an obesity rate of 5%. In relationship to 2019, it has risen to 19%. And over only the past 18 months since the dawn of COVID, we've seen those obesity numbers rise to an alarming high of 22%. So we must ask ourselves, what is the cause of this frightening status we find our children in? And where did we go wrong? To find these answers, we can turn to the historians and archives of data they have of the past to compare and contrast what life was like then to today and hopefully derive a solution to this life-threatening issue our youth is facing. One of the stark differences over the past 50 years is the independent freedom children were allotted to participate in youth-led activity, such as going to the park or playground all on their own. We also see in 1969, 48% of youth walked to and from school in comparison to 2009, where only 13% did. Given this comparative data, a hypothesis could be stated that when children's opportunities for independence are diminished, as so is their health. And this conclusion regarding a pressing issue of today could not have been reached without those historical archives of yesterday. Kinesiology is an ever-changing subject. The history of physical activity in the past, present, and future, the article written by Dreisen and Schultz, shows just that. When my colleagues and I are analyzing it, it's very easy to see how much kinesi kinesiology has grown just from the beginning of its start. Um, the importance of journals is very prevalent when we want to take a seat and study and really analyze the history of kinesiology. In the early times, there are very limited journals and resources for us to do this, but now as historians, we've learned the importance of uh, researching and analyzing and really data collection of these subdisciplines and the entirety of kinesiology that there is a basis of journals to be able to go through that. And going forward, we need to advocate and fight and be able to learn about the different paths that kinesiology took throughout its growth. That is why also when my colleague Corey began to talk about the race norms and the sex um, differences that are still prevalent in today's sports society it is continuously able to grow now what we need to do going forward once we know this information is how can we adapt it and shift it to be able to aid us in today's time and in the future we always need to be looking ahead there are children who are growing in obesity rates and why is that if physical activity has been known to be as important as it is why are we still not taking it into account these are all questions and that have answers that we need to find and we need to research through journals and experiments and given all these resources that we now have i think one of the most important um, pieces of information from not only this article but the kinesiology um, subject as a whole are the many subdisciplines that come into play. Recently, the sports psychology uh, subdiscipline has been growing in anticipation and in importance. We now know the effects of 
the mentality on a athlete's performance and that was once not even taken into consideration so given that little piece of evidence it just goes to show once we fully understand every subdiscipline of kinesiology together we can understand kinesiology as a whole and apply it to not only athletes but the everyday person since everyone needs to be physically active in order to survive and hopefully as a community and as a society we can continue to go through it thank you for listening to our presentation have a good rest of your day